uh, some of you that one, uh, one method to uh, actually calculate uh, the velocity, to obtain the velocity in a duct, the acoustic velocity, is the two microphone method. You have two microphones, M1, M2, and each is measuring a pressure P1, and this one is measuring P2. And you want to, from that information, you want to get the velocity. So uh, what you want is to get the velocity in the middle here. What is the velocity that, that is obtained? We use for that the momentum equation, which is minus dp by dx. In fact, this is one dimensional, so yeah, it's minus dp by dx. And, uh, and the idea is, to, is, is the following. We take, so th this is how it, this is implemented. You want to use that equation and uh, we, at a given frequency, you know the frequency here. This is a wave which is traveling and has a frequency omega. So we know that minus rho zero i omega v is equal to minus dp by dx. So in principle, you can write down v is equal to one over rho zero i omega. And here we have p1, p2, minus p1, divided by the, the distance delta x. But to, to be able to do that, you have to calculate the complex signal. These are real signals that you have here. You have a real signal here, a real signal he here. So how do you calculate something which is complex so that you can apply that equation? Well, it's, you use the Hilbert transform. You take the real signal, you, you take a Hilbert transform of the real signal and you obtain the complex signal and uh, this is for P1. P2, you make the Hilbert transform of that. So you get P1, P2 and, uh, and then you plug that here and in fact what you get is this is the equation you, that you can write. You cannot just plug in these two signals as they are. You plug in the complex signals here, you get a complex uh, uh, velocity here, and then you take the real part of V and you get the velocity. Yes? So what you're doing is introducing the phase shift yes. between the two signals. Yes, yes. But so this is only giving you the, the perturbation. If you have yes. a net flow, it won't catch that. No, you're right, yes. It gives you the velocity perturbation that, yeah. But uh, yeah, that, that's the method that we use very extensively in, in measuring, for example, transfer functions. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the Hilbert transform gives you, allows you to take real signals and transform them to get a, what we call the analytical signal. The, all right, so this is a homework. I hope you, you will try to do it. It doesn't take too much time, but uh, you learn a lot by doing by yourself. Um, let me now go to a second problem. The second problem is to say, now we have a duct and we would like to know the normal modes. What is this? Uh, let's assume, for example, that we have a, a duct like that. On one side, it's closed. On the other side, it's open. At the closed end here, what we can say is that the normal velocity is zero. At the open end here, we know that the pressure is zero. And uh, what are the solutions of the wave equation in one dimension which satisfy these boundary conditions? So the wave equation is d2p by dx squared plus k squared p is equal to zero. We know the solution. Uh, p has to be of the form e to the i k x plus b e to the minus i k x. We know the velocity. It's one over rho zero c a e to the i k x 
minus b e to the minus i k x. And now we have to write down the boundary condition. The boundary condition is that v at 0 has to be 0. So when we put x is equal to 0 here, it gives a is equal to b. So if a is equal to b, you see that p of x will be 2 times a cosine kx. So we know the shape of the, of the pressure field corresponding to these boundary conditions, satisfying this wave equation. And now we have to, to satisfy the fact that p is equal to 0 here. So cosine p of l should be equal to 0. So it means that cosine kl should be equal to 0. So this cannot be satisfied except for certain values of k. What are the values of k which satisfy that? They are such that k and l is equal to a, an odd multiple of pi over 2. For example, it can be pi over 2. So the first one is, uh, is n is equal to 0. It, it gives pi over 2, and then 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, and so on. So this, this, is, this is OK for certain frequencies. And the frequencies, now k is equal to omega over c. And omega itself is 2 pi f over c. So uh, what we see here is that the frequencies fn will be 2n plus 1 pi over 2 divided by 2 pi. And uh, there will be a c somewhere here. And l will be somewhere here. So the frequencies fn which correspond to these solutions are um, 2n plus 1, uh, c over 4l. So these modes, we, we know the modes. These are what we call the eigenmodes. They, uh, they correspond to the resonances if you have such a such a system, and you blow on the system, you know that certain frequencies will, will come out. And these are the frequencies. So for example, the first one, F0, will be C over 4L. And F1 will be 3C over 4L. And the, the next one will be 5C over 4L. It's also interesting to actually calculate the, the wavelengths corresponding to these different uh, frequencies. The wavelength lambda is equal to, uh, uh, to C divided by F0. So it makes 4L. And this one will be um, lambda, so lambda 0, lambda 1 will be uh, such that C divided by F1, 4 divided by 3L. So what we see is that L is equal to lambda 0 over 4. And L here is 3 3 over, four, uh, 3 over 4 lambda, lambda 1, etc. 5 over 4. And this we call quarter wave modes, 3 quarter wave mode, 5 quarter wave mode. So these are the modes. You had the frequencies. And we have this language, which is a little strange. What is a quarter wave mode? It's the fact that the, that the size of this duct is the wavelengths divided by, by 4 and then the wavelengths, three quarter of the wavelengths and so on. It gives you the, 
the idea, the, the wavelengths of these modes compared to the, the size of the duct. This is what, what has been done here. So this, this is a, already is a, is a modal analysis. You want to know what are the solutions of, uh, of this wave equation for certain boundary conditions. What are the natural solutions of such a... You have a bottle. A simple bottle has resonances. You know that by blowing uh, at the tip of the bottle, you can have a, a frequencies coming out. And, uh, and this, this is... Um, let me show you uh, an experiment. I, I don't have the film here, but there is a very nice experiment that you can try to, to, uh, to make in your garage. You put, uh, you have a system to hold two bottles. So one bottle is here. And the other bottle is on the, the other side, symmetrically placed. Uh, you take bottles uh, made of uh, plastic. All right. So you have these bottles here. And you put the loudspeaker here. And, uh, and, and you, you put uh, the wave at the loudspeaker. You, you put a wave, which is exactly one of the resonance frequency of the bottles. And this system will start rotating. Because you fabricate very strong resonances here. And this will induce a mean velocity out of the bottle, which will, which will make this rotate. They, at resonance, they, it rotates. Not very strongly, but it does. If uh, everything is carefully done, you can. So uh, resonance is very important. Without the resonance, you, you cannot get that. But just put a loudspeaker, and the whole thing is uh, rotating. Daniel Durox showed me this experiment. Uh, he loves to do things which are a little odd like that. <laughs> and uh, that was done. So you can try to do that. The mounting has to be carefully done here. I don't know how he did it so that it, uh, it's, uh, it's done. It allows the rotation to occur. All right. So now uh, another very technical aspect is that in many cases we have uh, changes in the area of the ducts. You, in many practical systems, it starts with a pipe, it gets bigger, smaller, and so on. It's, it's very often that we, we get such conditions. Uh, how does one cope with something like that? It's possible analytically. That is, you divide your your device, so the, the device is, is made of uh, successive sections. So you have a section here and another section here and, uh, and perhaps another section here. And uh, the idea is that you can always, in each section, have two waves. A and B, so AJ, AJ plus one, BJ plus one, BJ. You can write down these equations and then you, you have to, uh, to write matching conditions at these changes in section. You, you get from section SJ to section SJ plus one. And the two matching conditions are that the pressure is continuous. So you write that Pj at xj plus 1 is equal to Pj plus 1 at xj plus 1. And uh, the other matching condition is that the volumetric, the acoustic volumetric um, velocity has to be uh, continuous. Sj times Vj at xj plus 1 should be equal to sj plus 1 times Vj plus 1 
xj plus 1. It's a continuity of the volume flow rate. It's a little strange. One would think that one should write the continuity of the mass flow rate, but not. Uh, I, it's, I, I cannot explain why uh, in, in simple terms here. But basically, these are the two conditions that you have to write. And once you write that, you can match the two waves from one to the other. It's uh, just a, a little bit of algebra. And, uh, and you get expressions of the amplitudes in the J plus one duct with respect to the amplitudes in the J's duct and the beta J's are just the changes. You can have changes in, in, uh, in area, but you can also have changes in, in the uh, density and the speed of sound because of temperature, because you have a flame and something like that. So basically this is how we treat uh, changes in, area, in areas as well as in uh, the characteristics of the, of the different, uh, the density and the speed of sound. So the, the, uh, the, again, uh, if, you, if, you are, uh, uh, if you have such a problem, you have to root, look at that a little more carefully and just do it by yourself. Yeah. Any question here? Is it? Yes. yes. Oh, and finally, you're, you're right. For example, these ducts will finally end here with P is equal to zero. And let's assume that on this side, you might have uh, 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 a wall, that some injection was taking place here, but basically this is a wall, V is equal to zero. So in this duct, you will write V is equal to zero. This will impose some uh, conditions on the A's and B's and that duct. And on this side, again, you will have a condition. And when you look at this system completely, it will, every, uh, everything will be uh, uh, fixed by these two boundary conditions. Yeah. I mean, unless we talk examples, but we have, I, I just, if I would like to, to be able to deal with boundaries and the corners, we just have a question regarding that, that this will affect. It it will d determine your system. For, uh, here, what you get is a transfer between this duct and that duct. You get a matrix, AJ plus one, BJ plus one, which will be given in terms of AJ and BJ. And you have similar transfer matrices from one duct to the other. You multiply all these transfer matrices and you get a matrix which will take you from here to here. And then you put your boundary conditions and, and the whole system is, uh, is obtained. It, it allows you, for example, to calculate the, the modes of such a system, which is a little more complex. Of course, you can also use COMSOL or one, one such, uh, uh, these days you are not, you, you, you might uh, use uh, direct, calculations using finite elements. Uh, that uh, will give the same answer. But the boundary conditions will determine all the amplitudes in, in your system and will determine the frequencies, uh, the resonance frequencies. For example, in a, the, the simplest case would be you take a, a, a duct and then you take a, a chamber like that. And let's assume that the chamber is open here, P is equal to zero, and let's consider that V is equal to zero here. This system is completely, can be completely solved by, first of all, writing down the, the transfer matrix and then writing down the boundary conditions at this position, at that position, and you get, you, you get all the uh, amplitudes and you get the frequencies at which it uh, resonates. We've done that many times, because many times you have this sort of things. You have exactly this, something like that. 
All right, let's continue. Um, I wanted to, to tell you a little bit about spherical waves because it's, it's important to know what, uh, how a wave propagates when you are in three dimensions. We, up to now, we've looked at one dimensions, but here we have the three-dimensional case. Now, what is changing here? We are going to look at just the simplest possible wave. So we are in three dimensions. And, uh, and what we are going to consider is a sound field which is uh, spherically symmetric. P is equal to P of R. R is the radius. We consider that P does not depend on theta and P does not depend on phi. Of course, you can look at that, but uh, it's, it's of minor importance, of lesser importance. Okay, so what, what, is the, uh, what is the equation for harmonic waves? We know that. This is it. And uh, if we only consider spherical waves, this becomes, so the, this Laplacian can be written 1 over r square d by dr of r square dp by dr plus k square p is equal to 0. So this is the, this is the Laplacian in, uh, in spherical coordinates, and we only consider pressure waves and velocity, which are only spherical. And um, it's interesting that, again, this, this equation can be solved very, in a very simple way by noting that, that this equation here, this is the Helmholtz equation, can be written also as d2 by dr square of rp, the product of pressure by the radius, plus k square pr is equal to zero. This is exactly equivalent to that. Uh, I thought I would put a slide to show that. You see, 1 over r squared d by dr of r squared dp by dr plus k squared p is equal to 0. You can write that as d2p by dr squared plus 2 over r um, dp by dr plus k squared, this one. And uh, this can be written also as r times d2p by dr squared plus d 2 etc. And you can see that d2 by the r square of pr is equal to this and is equal to that. So these two terms are just this. So finally, you get to this result. So basically, why did we do that? Because now the solution is explicit. We know the solution of that equation. It's p times r is equal to a e to i k r plus b e to the minus i k r. You see, it's uh, again a, an equation which we, we know how to solve. Uh, this, this is really uh, easy. And so the pressure is made of two spherical waves. One which is expanding, it is going outwards. This, this is the one, because always you have minus i omega t here. So this is a diverging wave. And then you have a converging wave, b over r, e to the minus i k r minus i omega t. You see, the, uh, in this case, again, we are, it looks very much like the one-dimensional problem, except that now the wave is, is being reduced. The amplitude diminishes with the distance. This is why when you have a source of sound at a, a certain distance, the amplitude is lower. It diminishes like 1 over r. This is it. This, this is the divergent, fortunately for us, because otherwise we would listen to all the sounds 
without uh, reduction. Unfortunately, when, when the sound is far, it's better. One, one, one difficulty, however, is the following. Suppose you are living close to a freeway or in the vicinity of a freeway. So you have uh, a bunch of cars which are all making noise. And in addition, you have some motorcycles. They are making even more. And you, you're sitting here. But you have all these sources which are right here. And how does the sound level diminish now? Well, it's like a line source. And the sound will diminish like 1 over the square root of r. In such a situation, you would hope that it goes like 1 over r. If one single source were there, yes. But because of the, the many sources, it diminishes like uh, the square root of r. So it's still, it's there, it, but it's not as effective. All right, so, so basically here, this is how the waves are reduced by the distance. And uh, so one wave is traveling outwards, the other one is traveling inwards. And when you are in a given situation, like in this, uh, in, in this system here, the two waves are important because some waves will be reflected by the walls and will come back. And to calculate the sound field in this complex room uh, is a little more complex. You cannot just keep one of these waves. But in many cases, you are in the open. So one single wave is expanding from the source. And you can write the, the system as, a, as just a, an expanding wave. Let me show you an example. Uh, so here, what we do is we calculate the velocity corresponding to the wave traveling outwards. And you see that the velocity is, looks very much like the pressure. You find that it has a, so we assume that the pressure is A to the IKR divided by R. The velocity obtained for that is A, 1 over O0C. So we, we know that already. This is the impedance uh, times A. And we have uh, 1 minus 1 over IKR, e to the IKR over R. What we find is that basically it's almost the same relation as before in one dimension, except that we have an additional term here. So there is a phase here coming in, but if the radius, if the distance r is sufficiently large, this term will be, sm uh, will be very large and will be negligible. And basically, at a distance in the far field, v will be like 1 over rho 0 c p. So for spherical waves, again, the, the relation between the pressure and the velocity is 1 over rho 0 c. So uh, when you are sufficiently far from the source, the velocity will be just like the pressure divided by rho zero c, the impedance, the specific impedance of the, of the atmosphere. Let's see. All right. If, uh, let's, uh, um, let me close this one anyway. Yeah. So uh, one of the problems that we, uh, can you hear me at the, at the top there? It's okay? You hear me? Yeah, okay. So one of the problem which, is, uh, which could be of interest to people uh, who uh, love to use uh, loudspeakers and, uh, is, is this uh, problem. This is the problem of uh, a pulsating sphere. You have a loudspeaker. Uh, somebody invented a speaker which is spherical. So the sphere is vibrating, and you want to know what is the pressure field at a distance. So you have a sphere. It's a model problem for acoustics in electroacoustics, let's say. You have a sphere. The surface of the sphere is vibrating, and the acceleration 
of this surface is W uh, double dot. This is the acceleration. You can measure that using uh, an accelerometer. Uh, the sphere has a radius A. And we want to know the pressure field at a distance from, from the center of the sphere. You want to know what, what is the pressure field. So of course, you already know that the pressure will be equal to some amplitude divided by r e to the ikr. And on the sphere, what you know is that rho zero dv by dt should be equal to minus dp by dr. So this is value, valid everywhere, but it's valid on the sphere itself. At r is equal to a, and this is at r is equal to a. And now what is dv by dt? Well, it's just the acceleration. So we can write on the sphere rho zero, w dot, this is the acceleration that you give to the sphere, is equal to minus dp by dr at r is equal to a. So you take p of here, you calculate dp by dr, you put r is equal to a and you get that. And when you do these calculations, you see you, you use that and when you do the calc, you, you write down this last equation which tells you what the amplitude will be and you get the amplitude. And what does it tell? You see the pressure field now The pressure field, of course, is a spherical wave because it was constructed like that. The sphere is producing a spherical wave and the pressure at the distance r and t looks like that. You have r here. Then uh, there is a phase which comes in because the sphere is is not at r is equal to zero, but uh, there is r minus a. There is minus i omega t here. And uh, what we have is that on this side, we decided to, to actually call w dot times four pi a square. So the, this is the volume acceleration. We call that Q double dot, so rho zero Q double dot divided by four pi. And, uh, and there is also a, a term one minus one minus Ka. Again, that's a solution that you can work by yourself. You, you've seen how it goes. And, uh, and what is interesting here is that if you want to get a very strong uh, pressure field at a distance, what you need is of course to get a, a good acceleration. So you, you need to have a, a strong acceleration of your, of your sphere. But in addition, you need a large sphere. This is well known when you do a rock concert, you're not going to put a small Twitter to, to inundate a crowd of uh, 100,000 people. You need a big and enormous uh, uh, loudspeaker so that you have a lot of area. And you multiply this area by the, vi the vibration is big and you put your earplugs and, uh, and you get the sound field. So, so it's a simple problem which tells you that you're not going to get a lot of power if you have a, just a small little speaker. It doesn't, it, it doesn't work. You need a big thing. Yes? 
and, you, and you've, you've solved the problem here. That, that's a problem of spherical waves. It, of course, it's a, an idealized loudspeaker. It's not what we use, but uh, it tells you, uh, of course, this, this is much, what is interesting here is that you get immediately uh, an idea of what is the pressure field. It, oh, in addition, if the wavelength is very large compared to the size of the sphere, this term will vanish. That term will not be very important. So basically, for point sources, for spheres of very small sizes, uh, this, is the, this is the result. So that, that's the sound field of a, of a point source. You see when Ka becomes very small because the, the radius is small compared to the wavelengths. All right, uh, let's continue. Uh, the last point here is to look at the, at the, um, at the energy. Uh, we are always interested in the energy. The flux of uh, acoustic energy and the energy density. So how do we, how can we get something for that? The reasoning is simple. We, we begin with uh, the two equations of acoustics, 1 over c squared dp1 by dt plus rho 0 divergence of v1. Uh, we take the other equation, rho zero dv1 by dt plus gradient of p1 is equal to zero. We multiply the first one by p1 and we multiply, we, we do a scalar multiplication by v1 for the second one. And what do we get? And we add the two. So what we get is one over C square uh, DP one square one half. Oops. Let's do it again. One over C square D by DT of one half of P one square plus um, P1, yeah, I should, um, yeah, I should divide that by rho zero. Let's divide that by rho zero here. And let's divide, um, yeah, and let's keep this one as it is. Um, oh, sorry. Um, Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. No, let's not divide that here. Let's multiply here by P1 over rho zero. So this makes rho zero square here. And here it's P1 divergence of V1 plus rho zero uh, D by DT of one half of V1 square plus V1 gradient of P1 is equal to zero. And now we see that this term and that term can combine. And also it is interesting to, to use these two terms together, to put them together. And finally what we get is the following. It's a balance equation for energy. D by dt of something that we call E plus divergence of F is equal to zero. And, uh, and what we see is that the energy density is one half of P1 square 
divided by rho zero c square plus one half of rho zero v one square. So this is the kinetic energy per unit volume, and this is the elastic energy per unit volume. And the, the flux, the acoustic flux, is just written P1 V1. So this is the flux, uh, and, uh, and you, can, you can see that it's, a, it's an energy per unit time and, uh, and per unit surface. If you don't see that, you see P1. Let's look at the dimensions of F. These are M, L minus 1, T minus 2. And V1 is L, T minus 1. So that makes M, T minus 3. And this is M, L2, T minus 3, that's a power, that's an energy per unit time divided by L square. So it's a flux. It's a flux of power. It's a flux of energy. So uh, what we got here is just a balance of acoustic energy. This is the acoustic energy density, and this is the acoustic energy flux. Um, it is very close to what, yeah, this is how it looks. You see the acoustic energy density, the acoustic energy flux. And this expression looks very much like what we find in, the, in electromagnetics. Uh, in electromagnetics, the equivalent is called the, how, how is it called in the, the theorem of pointing. Yeah, who did that, who, who said that? Very good. <laughs> So this is Pointing's uh, theorem, just to, to make the analogy. It, it doesn't, uh, there is no need for that here, but just to tell you that uh, it's similar. There is a, and in electromagnetics, the Pointing uh, vector is this uh, uh, vector product between the electromagnetic field E and, the, uh, and H. And uh, the energy density is, is given there and the, and the balance is there. So there is, a, there is a something very close when we do electromagnetics. Uh, let me also uh, tell you a little bit about units of, um, uh, uh, of acoustics. Uh, and uh, we have already introduced the decibel. So what, what is it? what we call the decibel, so the, the units in terms of acoustics, the sound pressure level uh, will be defined like that. It's a logarithmic, it's logarithm on base 10. And what we put here is the RMS pressure, the root mean square pressure divided by a reference pressure and the reference pressure is equal to 2 10 to the minus 5 pascals. So you see the, the reference pressure is really very, very small. It's, uh, it's minute, it's 10 to the minus, it's 10, to the minus 10 uh, bars. It's, uh, it's very small. Um, for example, if we take PRMS is equal to 2 pascals, you see that SPL will be 20 log base 10 of 2 divided by 2 10 to the minus 5. And this makes 100 decibels. And if we, per, if we use 20 pascals, so the SPL for, this is 2 pascals, the SPL for 20 pascals, this will be 120 decibels. 200 pascals is, um, is 140. 2,200 uh, is a 160. 
20,000 pascals is 180 decibels. With a, a certain device, we were able to get 210 pascals in the, in the chamber. It's a, what I call the very high amplitude modulator, was able to get very, very high level of, uh, in terms of uh, decibels. But this is the scale of decibels. Now, there is a second unit, which is the intensity level. And the intensity level is based on the intensity. What is the intensity in acoustics? It is just the, an expression that makes, uh, that uses the flux. You see the flux is P multiplied by V. And we've seen on various occasions that P and V were related. It's like P square divided by rho C. And what we call the intensity is PRMS square divided by rho zero C. So this is the intensity. And so the intensity level, now this time because the, this is square, it's 10 log, log 10 of the intensity divided by a reference intensity. And uh, by convention, the intensity, the reference intensity, you see the reference intensity that is being used is 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. Why? Because if we, if we look at, at this, pressure reference, and we calculate the intensity of that, you see I ref is equal to 210 to the minus 5 square divided by 400. It's not quite 400, but let's, let's consider it's 400. You see that this will give 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 12, and the 4 goes away watts per square meter. So by using that convention, the intensity level and the sound pressure level are nearly coincident. So that, that's why these two uh, units basically give you the same answer. One is more, well, tries to, to, to get you an idea of the intensity of the sound field uh, by using the, the flux, basically. It's a measure of the flux. The other one is just based on what you measure, the pressure. But the two are matching just by, by using this uh, convention. All right, I think, uh, I don't know. Yeah, this is what, what is shown here. So that, that was uh, an addition. I think uh, we, we can stop at this point. We are a, li a little early, but it would, I, I'm sure you're tired. Are you? Oh. So uh, four more times like that. <laughs> Three hours times, uh, f uh, four times again. So see you tomorrow. Well, see you at, uh, at lunch. We can continue the discussion on uh, whatever I've shown here today and we'll, we have the good basis for working tomorrow on the next topics. All right, you're dismissed. Okay.